Welcome to another CO2 Mondays. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and today I have a special guest, a good friend of mine, Timo Kofold. Um, today we're going to get into some great CO2 topics. We're going to dive into what Corel has. I've been following them for quite a few years, the time when I was working at Emerson, really talking about all the electronics Emerson had, and I've been following a lot of their product line, and they've been innovative uh, and innovating a lot of electronics product, uh, products globally, and I'm excited to have this conversation today. Welcome, Timo. Thank you for having me. Hello and welcome to everybody out there in the world. My name is Timo Kaufold. I'm here in Kettle, Germany, uh, responsible for the wholesale part. And also I'm the market development manager for uh, the area of retail in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Netherlands. Wow, that's a huge area. <laughs> awesome. Yes, awesome. beautiful area to travel. Yeah, I can't <laughs> wait to go and visit because I'm going to at some point. Why don't we get into a little bit about your history? Because I know we talked earlier and you were a technician or engineer in the field. Why don't we get a little bit of background about your story uh, in the CO2? Sure. So let's jump back to the beginning. Uh, I started in 1996 with uh, my first technical trainings in the, in the refrigerant sector. And um, yeah, I walked through the whole way. And the first time I touched the CO2 applications, must be around about 10 years ago. So um, this was the first time. And the first time I heard ever about CO2 was in the school, in our professional school. And that's what our teacher told us was, ah, okay, CO2, guys, relax. You will never see it in the real life. <laughs> this was something in the past we did, but nobody does this today. So relax, you heard it and you will never see it in the uh, real life. So today, more or less every new store, every new uh, supermarket that comes up is built with CO2. So I'm not really sure if his words were perfectly right for our future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that that's good. So you started out as a technician, worked your way in, learned about CO2, and then now you made your way to a manufacturer who builds a lot of components. And what I really like about that is that you were in the field and you've done, you know, you were in the trenches, you did it, you learned it. And then bringing that is huge for manufacturers. More manufacturers need technicians to, to bring their experience and their knowledge from the field, which is really good. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you do uh, at Corel and, and kind of how you play out the, the component sides of training and development on the CO2 side. Yeah, um, I started in Corel uh, roughly four years ago, exactly four years ago, um, my 20, May 2018. And I started here in the, our technical department. So they look for somebody who is answering all the technical questions from our customers in the field. And this was the place where I started. After a couple of months, we see pretty fast, okay, uh, we need somebody else who is in the, in, the, in the part for the, or in charge for the wholesalers because all of our wholesalers, the technicians, these are the guys, they receive the first questions normally. <laughs> the guys on the counter, they need help, they need trainings. Yeah. And it would be better if we can help them to help their customers because this is a, multi-level size and uh, uh, 10x formula how we can improve and help and this was also the way to start here with all our trainings and everything that's needed this was the first this were the first steps yes yeah and i really like that i think that is so important like and i talk to a lot of technicians all over the globe and i tell them like because I hear a lot of times, oh, the wholesalers aren't what they used to be. The suppliers don't understand. That's you need to help train them as well. Because refrigeration, you should you need to share it. When you share it, it's like learning it twice. So I I continue to do that, and I've done lots of training for wholesalers and suppliers. And I think it's very important as a technician to bring that knowledge to them, so they can share it to like you said the other technician. And as a manufacturer, I think that's very important to do that, so your customers know how to help their customers, just like you said. Exactly. Train the trainer and help everybody to help themselves. This yeah. would be our idea. 
<laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Why don't we get into some of the CO2 components Corel has? Because I know some of them, but I know over the last few years, you guys have been in development of a lot of different products and electronics, and I'd love yes. to hear a bit more about them. No problem. So give me a second. I will sh uh, share my screen. That's maybe a bit easier when I can do this. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One you go. second. So here I should be. And here we go. So when we talk about CO2, let's start with our biggest one. Here we are. Uh, let's start, start with the supermarket. This is something we all know and the bigger size we are all confident with. We know this works. We have a lot of experience, everybody with this and um, we can start. So to get a short overview, here we can see in our small supermarket, this could be our supermarket down the street um, with several cabinets, uh, with cold rooms and everything we need. We have the right controller for everything here in our little uh, supermarket. And yeah, let's start. Start with one core product, the expansion valve. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, every cold room, every cabinet needs this expansion valve. And here we have um, our expansion valve for CO2, but not only for CO2. We have some dedicated valves that are just for CO2, and we have some uh, expansion valves that can be used more or less for every refrigerant you're using because the pressure range is pretty wide yeah. and we can uh, work a lot with it. If you have any questions, please. Yeah, so, so what's the difference between your, say, your standard synthetic electronic valve and your CO2 electronic valve? What are the differences? Or are there? Yeah, there are many differences. Uh, we can start with the, oh, stop sharing for a moment. One second. Too much fingers at this time. <laughs> So, uh, stop sharing is here. Perfect. So, next one. The one part is the material of the expansion valve. Mm -hmm. So, and we have an expansion valve for, that's for the whole range, transcritical and subcritical. Okay. We use normally stainless steel. Yeah. And these, are these uh, stepper valves or are they pulse valves? Perfect questions. These are stepper valves. Carel only uses stepper valves. Awesome. We have driver for pulse valves, but we, our, own tri uh, our own valves are stepper valves. Okay, so that's, that's kind of an option that you guys offer. You can do pulse valves with your controllers or steppers, but Corel only offers steppers. Okay, great. Yes. So, and when we... Take a look at the valves for um, the standard refrigerant subcritical applications. We can use different materials. Okay. So that would mean that you have different uh, pressure ratings, I am assuming, because you have one that was stainless steel and that one's brass. Was that brass that I seen there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. So for the controllers themselves now, can, will the same controller work on CO2 as uh, standard synthetic? More or less, yes. Okay. Um, we have to decide what kind of uh, driver we need. Do we have uh, a unipolar or bipolar uh, motor valve? So that's one question. It's yep. about the, the power of the, of the motor um, in the normal field. If I go to the wholesaler and, uh, and I buy a valve, it's bipolar. That's a standard in the whole market. Um, that's the one question. The next question is, do I have only a controller for controlling superheat or do I use a controller that is able to do more? Hmm. We have controller that like our EVD evolution. This is this funny little guy here. Okay. Uh, camera 
three. Yes, here yeah, here we are. <laughs> this funny little guy. Uh, and here we can use the uh, controller for nearly everything in our um, in our refrigeration plant. We can use it for um, superheat control. We can use it for hot gas bypass. We can use it uh, as a CO two um, uh, high pressure valve. So on, wow. so on, so on. Okay, so that, that leads me to another point. That that controller itself, you could use it as a case controller if you want, and it'll do all the temperature probes, temperature, you know. Um, and you said high pressure valves. Do, does Corel have high pressure uh, and bypass valves? Flash gas. Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 We have dedicated high pressure valves, dedicated um, flash gas valves. Mm -hmm. One second. I have one here by my side. <laughs> so, so I have now everything here in my little studio and there's nothing more on stock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So high pressure valve. This is how our high pressure valve okay. looks like. And you see the difference. We don't have the classical needle yeah, yeah. like we have it here in mm. the expansion valve. Is that a That's gasket a that difference. I see right under the threads there? Is that a black gasket? Uh, this one. Yeah, is that a gasket? Yes, Okay. exactly. And is that something that can break down or uh, is that something if you uh, install the valve while that's screwed in, would it damage it? Absolutely. One of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, really the, the big funniest things. Um, you have to take care to the, to the gaskets, absolutely. Yeah. So with that one there, um, that one would be weld, uh, welded in, but you need to make sure that you don't have it screwed in because you will damage that, right? Absolutely. Great. That's the reason why I love, why I really love this uh, valves. You can take everything that could be damaged in the welding process. You can take it outside. Yeah. So, and that's and, one good, really good thing about it. Like if that something happens to the valve in general, because I've heard of this a lot, where a valve gets damaged and it's a it's a throwaway valve, right? You can't take it apart. And uh, I really like that because now you don't have to cut into the system. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and yeah. We, we all know how funny it is uh, if you have a, a broken valve, where is this valve? You have it downstairs in, in the deepest, uh, in the deepest, darkest rooms <laughs> or upstairs on, on the rooftop, um, especially when it's really boiling hot or it's a, a blizzard blasting outside. <laughs> yeah. Then you have to, to change your valve or anything outside or that outside. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, so that, that's really good to know. Um, in the manual for that, will it have the exact torque specs as well for them to, yes. to torque it on? Do you have to put any like oil or anything on the threads when you're torquing it in? Like, can you talk about a little bit of the installation process of those? Yeah, uh, we also have some uh, videos for the installation oh, processes on, uh, for different valves. And I hope I can produce some more this and next year. So. Awesome. Yeah, we were looking forward for this and do this with some professional schools here uh, in Germany, but maybe also with our colleagues in Italy. But yeah, we will we will see. Uh, and yes, um, for sure, all information are in the leaflet. Yeah. The leaflet is inside the box. And now this is the first thing that's gone throw away. Yep. Yeah, that, exactly. So anyone on uh, the people that are on here, they're good. They're going to read it. But anybody that's listened to this on the podcast or watching you guys outside. You, yeah, you need to read the manuals. It's so important. And it's only one or two pages. You know, these installation manuals they are not big. They're one or two, maybe four pages maximum. It's very important to read them because <clears throat> to be honest, I did that in the past. I took the manuals and I checked them because I wasn't experienced enough. Now it's important to read those and after you read them a few times, then you can then you can throw them away. But really, you should leave them there at the system so other technicians can read them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I did it the same way. The first thing we did, 
uh, paper waste. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Throw yeah. it away. Uh, and later on, somebody asked, "Did haven't you read the manual?" Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sure there was no no, no manual or something yeah. like this. Yeah, so when I did tons of technical support when I worked at Emerson, I would I would just read, actually just read the manuals to technicians, and they're like, "Trevor, you're just such an expert. You're an expert." <laughs> and I'm like, "I just read the manual that should have been in the box that you should have." Oh, oh, well, thank you for saying I'm an expert. I appreciate that. <laughs> so you have yeah, so you have a high pressure valve and you have a bypass valve, and those valves can be controlled by the uh, what's it what's it called again evd evolution evolution evd evolution so now that controller um, it will control synthetic co2 and then inside it i'm assuming you pick a certain parameters for the high pressure valve certain parameters for the bypass and do you need this is another question on top of that there's a lot here do you need two of those controllers, one for the high pressure and one for the bypass to control the two of them? So two separate controllers? Um, not really. You can buy one controller with two drivers ah, inside. Yes. It's called the EVD twin. <laughs> yes, excellent. So uh, there you can choose really every application separately. They completely work uh, separately. Okay. That's uh, the, the brilliant thing at this controller. Yeah. And that's one really important thing for all technicians and anybody that is working with electronic components. You really need to understand those controllers. You need to understand and read those manuals. I've had it so many times where they just throw the manuals. Well, how come this is not working? I don't know how to get into the control. You need the manuals. Doesn't matter what manufacturer it is. You need those manuals. So now you get you get a twin and you're going to do your high pressure and your bypass valve. Can those controllers, because I know your main, is your main facility controller called the BOSS? Uh, no, our okay. main, the, the BOSS is um, a monitoring and supervisory system. Okay. Uh, um, it's more or less an add-on uh, product. Okay. So with, with the BOSS, we have some more superpowers in our application and we uh, can use the connected intelligence of all of our controls. Every control is still working for themselves. Oh. But when we connect them, um, we are Modbus to yeah. our boss, or in the past it was Plant Watch or Plant Visa, this was mm -hmm. the old guys, uh, now it's boss. Uh, we have many, many, many possibilities to work with this one. So when we think again about our uh, supermarket or hypermarket or whatever. Um, if each controller knows what the other controller is doing, here we can improve in energy efficiency. Mm. Here we can improve our service. And uh, also, when there's some troubleshooting, we can take a look what was in the past. This this is something in my active part, especially in the in the earliest years, no one knows what was 20 minutes before you came to the to the plant. So uh, <laughs> you had to find out how could this application works, maybe what was. Um, but now we can measure it, we can record it, and we can exactly see where this whole uh, journey starts. And this is something really exciting. You can really see when everything changed. Yeah. And I think that's very important. That's what I really like about some systems I've worked on in the past, like microthermal, for example. I can see 14, 20 different graphs in a row, and you can align them all up, and you can see, okay, which one is it? So I'm assuming this will be a similar thing. You can go through the data, and you can see the data that, okay, this is where everything started to change because when one thing changes, it affects almost everything else in a CO2 system. So exactly, and it, that's the same in every other system. Um, when, when you think about some air conditioning systems, VRV or how they ever are called. I worked a lot with Daikin in the past years um, and, and I installed many of these installations of these VRV systems. Uh, I started with the VR, VRV2, I guess. And, we did a lot of recording. Every 
commissioning was recorded. Uh, every service was recorded. And we can, we can see what happened to these applications. You can see what, is your, what, are, what are your expansion valves doing? What are your bypass valves doing? And what have they done in the past? What is the normal state of a really good working application? And uh, if you know this, this is, this is uh, un unbelievable what you can do with this information. Yeah, and that's what I really like is the more information as a technician, when you come into a, a store or into a problem and you can see the whole system as a whole, you can look at the bigger picture, which is really cool. And I really enjoy that. So when you say that uh, they're independent, if your main facility controller, uh, say, fails, the, con the store will continue to run. Exactly, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't go into a backup mode or anything. It just all those controllers are independent, running their circuits, running their their cases or whatever. Cool, cool. Why don't we to get into some of the electronic valve? Um, so you have both the transcritical side, electronic valves, no, not, and then you have the subcritical side that you showed us just now. Uh, I'm sure you've done a lot of field support with these, and you've seen a lot of them in the field. What are some of the good installation practices when a technician is installing uh, a Corel uh, system? Uh, it starts with the design of the application. So the, the first question is, what is my application? And what is, what is it what I want to do with, with my whole calculation with the design? Um, maybe this is a good point. I have to change my view here a little bit. Um, to take a look in our calculation tool, the CPQ. Uh, because what is that called? CPQ. I show it one second. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I take a lot of notes in the in these talks, so it's uh, <laughs> hopefully you're, perfect. you're taking notes too. So let's have a look. The first thing you will see now is my okay. Yes, yep. is my e-learning platform or our e-learning platform. Maybe you can talk later about this. But this is the first step in our CPQ. You can uh, select uh, valves. There's our old EXV lab integrated, and you can select also some uh, sensors and all security and safety stuff. So. We create a new product uh, project. Here we go. Just have something inside just for this little training. So, okay, I forgot something. Customer. Ah, yeah, customer. There we are. Come on, I know I, I have some customers inside here. <laughs> Take this guy, I know. There you go. <laughs> so, the first thing we have to select is our application. Mm -hmm. What do we want to select? Let's start with, um, yeah, let's take CO2. We are talking about CO2, let's mm -hmm. take it. Um, and now we can decide what kind of application is this here. Uh, the one or another could ask transcritical, subcritical. Uh, um, why do we ask this question for expansion valve? Normally the expansion valve is still on the subcritical side in the most parts. Mm -hmm. Mainly, yes, but we also deliver our um, our valves for applications that are used in real transcritical applications mm -hmm. in the HVAC, um, mobile air conditioning and other parts, we, we are really working on the transcritical part. So wow. this is something to keep in mind. So, so you're saying you have systems out there in air conditioning that you're using these as transcritical valves? 
complete full transcritical systems. They're wow. still existing. The, the normal Richard technician will never see them. Yeah. <laughs> but um, some people will still see this. Uh, and a show. Yeah. yeah get one. that book. Get that. That just came out there like a few months ago. Yes. One the, of the best books ever. Yeah. That, that is, uh, that, that's a given. If you don't have that book, you need to get that book. I know I'll, I'll see if I, I'll put the links up in the, the YouTube video and the podcast for that book, because I think it's very key to, to get into that for natural refrigerants. Yes. So for everybody in the podcast, Natural Refrigerants, Applications and Practical Guidelines. It's a book from uh, Michael Kaufeld, mm -hmm. not Kaufold, Kaufeld, yeah. Michael Eckert and Volke Siegesmund. Um, really, really great book. And you can find everything in there you need to know for uh, Natural Refrigerants. Okay, back to our lovely... Uh, calculation. So normally we would do the calculation in our uh, subcritical version because you know after our receiver we have subcritical yep. way normally. So and here you see the first thing I have a plus sign so I can add some other informations um different calculation uh trevor do you have some numbers for me i should yeah, select sure um 20 kilowatt okay uh minus 10 okay um 34. 34 okay so now we take the next one. So now we have one dedicated point. My question would be, what is this? What is this exactly? Uh, what are we talking about in this calculation? Is this the standard, the, the nominal um, value for this valve? Is it the maximum or the minimum? But where are we in this range? So I would, to, to, I would suggest everyone to think about this, not just calculate it from a kind of uh, Excel sheet or uh, from another tool that tells you your cold room needs 20 kilowatts. What are these 20 kilowatts compared to what? And what kind of application is behind this? What kind of compressor are you using? We, we lost your volume. Oh, no, nope, no, there you are. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when this is just one room in a big plant with, I don't know, 200, 300, 400 kilowatts of um, complete uh, needed uh, power consumption. So no problem. But if you have only one compressor and this is speed driven, we should talk about it. What is our range? Mm, yeah. So that, that's very important because more and more systems are like that. You're going to see these single systems and I see more and more CO2 condensing units come out there and they're not in the, the supermarket application. So that's a really good point, Timo. Yeah, and we see a lot of systems dying because nobody cares about our compressor. Nobody cares about oil. Nobody really asks the question, um, what are we doing with this 20 kilowatts? Mm -hmm. When the 20 kilowatts are our nominal, our uh, mm -hmm. nominal Leistung, um, uh, yeah, value, that's yeah. okay, but we should have an eye on the minimum also and the maximum. Yeah. So let's enter minimum. Push the wrong button. Okay. Before we fetch 20 kilowatts, now let's say 10. 
Uh, here we have minus 10. Yeah, minus right? 10. Minus 10. And, ah, sorry. Subcritical. 34. <laughs> 34. So leave it there. So now you can see you have two valves you can use mm -hmm. that will fit. Yeah, because before there was a bunch of valves. There. Exactly. Mm. And when we do this with a standard refrigerant or, or with a complete standard solution and we would choose a standard valve, there would be more valves. Yeah. And here, here you can see where you're going to be. What is this valve doing? And uh, is everything fine? Yeah. I suggest every of my customer use three points, minimum, maximum, and anything in the middle. Yeah. Uh, to see where you really are. Because many people think, hey, it's an electronic expansion valve. You never get problems like, like hunting or anything like this. Wrong, totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's the big thing that I've noticed after starting to learn about electronic valves and teach them and train them is that, oh, we never had this issue with a TX valve. Well, you never seen what the TX valve was really doing, right? <laughs> yes, right. And right. what I like about electronics and see you just talking about the minimum max is so important because one of the key things when I was troubleshooting and I am troubleshooting electronic valves, I watched a percentage of it opening. You know, where yes. is it open at? And this is how you really troubleshoot because if it's at 100%, why is it at 100%? Is it really at 100%? Did you wire backwards? There's so many different things, but I, keep going. Sorry for, for jumping in there. No, that, that, that's really perfect. Um... And also we have uh, the other part, um, the opening, the start opening, this is something we can enter in all of our controller. You have to know what you're doing. The, the standard settings will work, okay, more or less, but you will yeah. never be efficient. Um, when, you, when you really know which kind of valve you're using and what is your cold room or your cabinet doing, you can optimize everything. Yeah. And you could choose, maybe the 200 kilowatts are exactly where we start every time, um, you, could end, you could enter this opening percentage, you can read out here uh, in, the, in the driver and start there to control. So mm -hmm. perfect, you know what this thing is doing. And ideally, the, the valve will never open wider. We would start to control and it would close step by mm -hmm. step. So when you have recorded this, you see it, everything works fine. You are really happy with your work. You have done all the best. The control is adjusted to the best ever. Um, and the next time you have a service, you can control it and you can see what is, what is happening. If your valve starts to open more and more and going out of range and is at 100% per, uh, opening, you know, here's something really, really wrong. Yeah. Maybe I'm missing refrigerant in our in the system, or I have a totally different problem. Yeah. So is that recorded in the controller itself that you can go see? Mm, no. Nope. Back to that's the a, main. This is something yeah. we are okay. doing with our boss. Yeah. Okay. I just want to clarify that. I wasn't sure. So so, so that's cool. Okay, so, so far? Yeah, so this, no, this is great. So with the controller, just so some people may have not worked on electronic valves before, and so it's no different with CO2 or any standard synthetic, you'll have your valve, you'll have your controller, plus you'll also have a transducer, which is going to be measuring your pressure, as well as a temperature probe. Why don't you talk about those a little bit and how important they are to this setup? Absolutely. Um, it's the same like we measure our superheat or anything else. You have to find the right place for the positioning of your sensors and you have to do it right. Um, just a little story of, from, my, uh, from my past. I had a, a chiller for machine cooling. I have no idea what kind of machine was behind that, but there was a chiller and we had a TV 
built in. Plate cooler, and the thing, this thing didn't work. So we saw the valve was broken. Okay, so let's change it. I changed the valve, TV, and it took five minutes. And the complete heat, uh, the uh, heat exchanger, the, the, the uh, water cooled pleat changer was frozen in five minutes and broken and gone. <laughs> I had no idea why. <laughs> so one time, okay, this can happen. Nah, change everything, start, from, start again. We see you next week. So, okay. Um, first time, broken. The second heat exchanger and expansion valve changed, started again, broken oh, in five I've minutes. So, okay. Oh. One time could happen. The second time, never. We, ha we have made, we must have made any problem here, any mistake. I have no idea. So I called this guy who created this uh, plate heat exchanger. I talked to him. Okay, I have this problem. The machine starts running five minutes and everything was frozen. So, okay, where's sensor from your TEV? So, on the same point where it was before. This was not my question. My question is, where is it exactly positioned? So, okay, took some pictures, sent, uh, sent him the pictures and uh, he called me back. Okay, guy, drop it. This is definitely the wrong person, uh, the, uh, the wrong position for this sensor. So one meter um, behind the, the heat exchanger, you can place it. Okay, one, one meter. Maybe I find one meter uh, behind the heat exchanger. But, but, but why? That's okay, easy. The only thing you are measuring now is the temperature of the, of the uh, heat exchanger, but not of your refrigerant. Mm. So don't care. Now you know why everything is frozen up because uh, you don't measure the right temperature. And the same thing we have to do with all of our sensors. They need to be placed accurate and the, on the perfect situation, on the, on the perfect positioning. And if you check your leaflets, your manuals, mm -hmm. you will find it where they are to place and how. And this is something we see a lot of times. Um, the people don't use the right tools to fix them. Um, we have some information in our leaflets. You have to uh, wind the cable three times in a row um, on, on the tubes. So why is this? It's pretty simple to have the right temperature in the sensor and not the temperature of the air or something else. These are all the things we have to consider. It's, you may say it's easy. It's a daily business. Yes, but the most people don't know it. We didn't get them these, uh, teach this information in the schools. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn it. You have to read it. Yeah. And you have to visit such kind of trainings. Yeah, no, exactly. And I've seen lots of that too, where you need to make sure that you put them in the right place. Uh, place if you put it at the bottom of the pipe it's going to fill up with oil oil <laughs> right it's going to fill up it's like you don't put your bulb at the bottom of a uh, uh, your suction line why would you put your transducer and i've seen that before so it's important to, to follow those instructions because you can run into these issues and the temperature probe's a big one as well uh, tell me some of your stories about the temperature probe you know how does it have to be installed do you have to use on yours, you have to use something solid that's going to hold it to the pipe and not break? This would be nice. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I've seen so many with just like plastic zip ties that freeze and don't freeze over, uh, over time. Or they use the, uh, instead of the plastic zip ties, there are some uh, from metal, really tough metal, and they, they screwed really hard so <laughs> yeah a couple of it, minutes it later and yeah. everything is gone <laughs> yeah yeah and those ones there have to be insulated as well really yeah. make sure you insulate those ones because if you don't 
you might get air infiltration so it's it's very important to follow the manufacturer's instructions so important what about when you're wiring it up so these would be are, are they four they're four wire valves i i'm assuming because you said bipolar is that correct yes. yes so why don't you talk about the wiring and how important that is when you're installing these uh yeah the, the funny thing is um especially when we talk about our four wires the bipolar valves uh the driver will recognize if, if there is anything wrong more oh. or less more or less okay but you can do one thing uh when you turn the wiring completely it will run in the wrong direction mm -hmm. from your point of view mm -hmm. the valve is doing a complete great job uh but you would say what is this what what kind of trap is this it should open and it close yeah uh, the, the, the driver is broken or something else yeah <laughs> uh, no exactly. not really that, and that's so important to know because I've seen it many times. Oh, it's it's closed the valve, but how come it's flooding? Why is the compressor flooding? Why is it washing out? Yes. What's going on here? So it's important. What about length? So how far can that controller or the valve be from the controller? Is there a specific length? Yeah, we can find the complete information in the leaflet and the manual for sure. Um, for the for these valves, we can talk about roughly 100 meters. Wow, that's three, yeah, 300 feet. That's huge. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You have to consider what kind of cabling are you using? Where are you mounting your cables? This is uh, something you really should take care. Um, use shielded cable. I would ever use shielded cable mm -hmm. every time. Every time. I say the same thing anytime because there's so much harmonics and I've seen this before in the field and I've talked to people from Corel before the same issues where, you know, you got the wire running 150 feet all by high voltage wires. And why is the valve? The valve's all over the place. It does. It's hunting. It's Bes up. beside the elevator and the, the big ones. <laughs> yeah. And this is one thing that all technicians out there, anybody working on electronics, you got to understand there's a lot of harmonics. And if you got variable speed drives and you got other equipment that's in there, you got to pay attention. And quick question on uh, using shielded wire. Do you ground both ends or just one end? It depends. It depends. <laughs> it's, okay. it, it totally depends. Um, when I'm on the same level and I'm using the same power supply and have, and I have the same ground, you can use both. That's okay. If not, you have to check. You really have to check because when you are in a, def in a uh, different level with a totally different power supply and totally different uh, grounding, this can create some new problems. Yes, and I love that you brought that up because no one thinks of that. They're thinking, okay, I'll ground it here and I'll ground it at the other end. But what if there's Perfect. a problem at that one? What if there's a problem grounding on that end, right? So it's great. Right. And many people also do one thing wrong. Um, if they have a, um, some kind of metal background anywhere or a tube, they want to connect the shield or the grounding. And it must be completely blank. You have to clean everything. No oxygen. On, on the side uh, of our metal plate, you have really to clean it. Really, yeah. nobody does this. Yeah. And it, it brings huge problems. <laughs> yeah, grounding is one of, the, one of the biggest issues. You see it in even residential stuff that you need to ground, tons of issues there. Uh, air conditioning, same thing, ground so important. Refrigeration, it's so important. And it's like, oh, it's ground, I'll just throw it right here. Paint, rust, does, doesn't matter, it's good. It's good. So I'm, glad, I'm glad you bring up those points because it's important with electronic valves, especially when you're talking about CO2 valves. And now this is something new to you, like CO2 is new. Then you're just like, oh, that's, it's a problem, CO2, all these electronics. No, it's still me as the technician that needs to make sure that I'm doing it properly. Absolutely. Awesome. What else? Uh, so we talked about the high pressure valve. We talked about the flash gas bypass valve a bit. We talked about the electronic valve. What else do you guys have for CO2 um, components? When it comes to CO2, um, I think we should 
also talk about a little bit about our controllers uh, for the rack. Um, we have our P rack controller, and we also can talk a little bit about of our um, DLTC compressors and the speed drivers for this. Mm, I'd love to hear about those. <laughs> so let's check. I will share my screen again in a couple of seconds. Funny thing is, my laptop uh, screen is totally frozen. So I, I have to take the big one uh, eight meters <laughs> in, from my side. <laughs> so uh, where are we? So, good question. Where is now my presentation? This looks like a presentation. Take a so, chance on it. Ah, one, one second. That's okay. Yeah, this, this is the one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Great. So. So do you have, uh, just before you go ahead, so I see refrigerant gas leak detectors. Is that for CO2 yes. too? Can you, or just? Yes. Static? Yeah, you have. Absolutely. For, for all refrigerants. Mm, okay. These guys are pretty nice. Um, I, I like them really because you can uh, use them with an app. So in the app, you can see everything. And uh, when you connect these funny, funny little guys with our boss monitoring system, you can also see the, the level of gas detection. Okay, so that's when it's with the boss or standalone? Can you see it standalone or only with the boss? You can use it standalone. Ideally, you connect it with the boss. Yeah. Well, because if you had 17 in the store, then you can see all 17 and it'll give you a better idea. I totally understand that. Perfect. Exactly. And uh, when you have some problems, you see the expansion valves are going more open and open and open over the time. Um, and your the energy consumption is not that attractive. It should be. Um, you can take a look in your whole plant, what is going on. Maybe one of these guys has some slight peaks. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could say, okay, I have here one cold room with some peaks in our gas detections. No alert, no, alert, no, no alarming at this moment, but some peaks. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should watch this cold room or this cabinet first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something. Okay, um, in so one of the last the P rack, sorry, yes, the P rack that is for you can use that for CO two and does that will that control the high pressure valves or do you have to add the controller the evolution controller twin? Uh, the P rack is, is, is a huge range of products. Um, you can use one P rack. Transcritical, oh, we, we divide them in transcritical and subcritical. Mm -hmm. um, of, of PREC 300T, transcritical, PREC 300, subcritical. And when you choose a PREC 300T with built into driver, he can use, he can manage it completely by himself. But you can also connect them to um, EVD evolution. Mm -hmm. So they can also speak together. And that's the best way to do any system. When you can have everything talking together, it makes troubleshooting so much easier. Exactly. And the complete plant efficient. Awesome. Uh, this was something from, I guess, the last podcast or the one before when, we, when it comes to uh, the gas cooler and a CO2 application. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our chill booster. It's a kind of adiabatic cooling system mm, yeah okay and one question from you was also what is about the water consumption um just one idea to give it directly to you if we use one liter of water here we will um reduce the amount in cooling by an uh, by a cold uh, coal plant um, electrical plant, uh, we will reduce this by two liters. 
So one liter invested here in our application will reduce two liters roughly uh, on the electrical plant. Wow, I need to look into that. I have to look into that. And so how does this, because I can kind of see, is it like a whole spray system that you would install on a gas cooler, I'm assuming? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we calculate the, the complete temperature and uh, humidity outside, and mm -hmm. we'll see how can we ideally work with our chill booster. Yeah. No, I, I'm going to look into that more because depending on where you're at in the world, it's viable and not, you know, if it's yeah. you're in a place where it's so 100% humidity, it's not going to not going to get the value out of it. Right. So I'll check that stuff out for sure. Is that something new? Is it, yeah. No, that's not really new. Um, the chill booster is pretty long in the market okay. uh, and we use it a long time. Carell is, is coming from the humidity side. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, well, that's the funny thing. I was at a, a trade show about two months ago and Corel's there, big booth, and they were just there on their humid, uh, the yes. humidity side. And I'm like, oh, didn't know you had this whole other humidifier division. You know, and it was massive. There were like three or four people there. It was pretty cool. Yeah, we are one of the uh, biggest producers in the world for humidifier. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I love this. I love this. Okay, well, I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, Timo, today or tonight for you coming to hang out with us and just giving us kind of an overview of uh, Corel as well as Electronic Valve. Uh, I, I highly suggest anyone who has questions, please throw in the chat or unmute yourself. If people want to get a hold of you or Corel, how would they do that, Timo? So you can reach out to me, uh, to me uh, with um, LinkedIn. So I'm yeah. easy to find there. Uh, also, some of my colleagues worldwide. We have uh, sub subsidiaries everywhere in the world. So there's for sure somebody who can talk with you. Um, also, our Karel homepage and our Karel YouTube channel is something I would highly recommend. Um, especially when we would like to talk about something like this. This brochure, mm. everything for CO2. Mm. This would something I would hand over to you. This is something uh, everybody should know. Yeah. You have many basics inside there. And also if you work with uh, the classical refrigerant, cold rooms, our cellar range, cold room solutions. Nice tools, nice informations. Yeah, I'll definitely throw that in the description and in the YouTube and the podcast so people can find it easily because it's so important to know the components that are out there because all the manufacturers like you and all the other big manufacturers you have so many cool products and it's hard to get them all out there. So it's good just to invest your time to research some of the products you're working on. CO2 is coming to the market. It's nothing new like Corel has this for years. These aren't new products that Corel has. But we need to invest our time to learn about the products different manufacturers have, just like Corel. So I want to thank you so much, uh, Timo, for taking the time out of your evening to have a conversation with us about CO2 and your product line. And we'll go and see if there's anything in the chat. Um, got a question here. Uh, do the EEV uh, close completely when no refrigeration is needed or a solenoid needed before in the liquid line? Perfect question. I love this one. Uh, the EEV is closing completely. Mm. So you don't need a solenoid valve and uh, you should avoid to have one if this valve is really completely closing. Mm. I can show this also one time. Uh, yeah, let's show it. This one, is, this one is running. <laughs> so, now let's start. You can see how this one starts to work. It's completely closed and now we start the regulation. Mm. It opens up to roughly 50% 50, 50 waits for six seconds and then after the six seconds it starts to regulate. Yeah. So, and when I disconnect, okay this was a little bit too fast um within one minute our 
ultra cap, collect all the, uh, the, the power mm -hmm. and is able to close the complete valve. Yes. And that's something important you just said there, that extra component, mm -hmm. that super cap, you need that. It's uh, because if not, you're going to, um, you're not going to have, it's not going to shut. It's going to just stay in this position, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, Timo, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see everyone at the next CO2 Mondays with Trevor. Have a great one. Bye-bye. See ya.